So how many of you think rape is wrong? Show of hands. So that's everybody. Good. If it wasn't, I'd be a little concerned. Um, so I founded a national anti-rape campaign, and one of the things that we do is we conduct workshops in schools and colleges and workplaces and that kind of thing, and we talk about the relationship between systemic gender-based discrimination and rape and how these things influence each other. And at the end of every workshop, there's always one individual in the audience that raises their hand and asks, but ma'am, why are you here? Ma'am, we get it. We get that rape is wrong. We will not rape anybody. We are with you. We understand the problem. We are not part of the problem. The real problem is in the villages. The real problem is those uneducated, illiterate men who rape. The real problem is the rapists. You need to convince the rapists that rape is wrong. Only then will you solve the problem of rape. And think about that for a second. That's really interesting because our solutions to our problem are obviously dependent on, on our understanding of the problem. So when we're trying to solve the problem of rape, we ask ourselves two main questions, right? We ask ourselves, why does rape occur? And why is rape wrong? And for the first question, when I've asked people, um, why does rape occur? They tend to say things like, well, rape occurs when a man, probably from a rural background, probably poor, possibly uneducated, maybe illiterate, comes across a girl, probably from the cities, urban, upper middle class or middle class, probably wearing short skirts, possibly drunk, outside late at night, um, and he sees her and he rapes her, right? And she's always wearing short skirts, this girl, because it's important that this girl is under Western influence, right? Because we also, in India, link rape to cultural infiltration and um, the presence of the West. Now, when you ask people, or when I've asked people why is rape wrong, they say rape is wrong because it violates the honor, the dignity, the respect, the izzat of a woman and her family and her community and the nation. It soils her forever. Nobody will marry her. There was a video that just came out um, asking men if they would marry a rape victim, and a lot of them said no. Um, so yeah, nobody will marry her, um, and that's quite sad. Um, and so if that is what we think the problem of rape is, then our responses are obviously attacking those exact mindsets. So if we think that the problem of rape is a violation of gender norms, if we think that rape happens because women should be protected and they aren't being protected enough, then the way that we end up responding is by protecting women more, by keeping them at home, by keeping them in self-contained safe havens, right? If we think that the problem of rape is that men should protect and that they are not protecting enough and that that is what is leading to rape, then we end up having national campaigns like real men don't rape and real men drop women home after 9 p.m. And there was a really famous anti-rape video that just went viral that some of you may have seen called Protecting Women is a Religion. Um, and it basically had a girl that was walking somewhere, and then these two men come and stand in front of her, and they look really intimidating, ostensibly the way that rapists look at a woman. And then this one guy comes, and he's dressed in explicit Hindu attire, and he stands between the woman and the rapists. And then another Muslim guy comes, and he holds the Hindu guy's hand, and they're both standing between the woman and the rapists. And then a Christian guy comes, and a Sikh guy comes, and men from all these different religions come, and they form a protective circle around her. And she's standing in the middle of the circle going, yes, like, I am protected. I'm not going to be raped. And the ending text of the video shows, protecting women is in every religion. Protecting women is a religion. And the obvious problem with the video is that the woman itself has no agency because she's literally subject to the whims of any man that comes in her way. The man has to choose whether he's protector or violator. The woman has no say, right? If we, th um, if we think that rape is a violation of gender-based boundaries, if we think that rape happens because women should not be out after a certain hour, because women should not wear 
inappropriate clothing, then what we end up doing is imposing further restrictions on things like clothing choices and things like staying at home. And these restrictions are gender-based, right? So in the Shakti Mills case, which was two photojournalists, a woman and a man who went to an abandoned warehouse to take photos for a newspaper, the man was tied up, the woman was gang raped. Um, and I was reading about the Shakti Mills case, and some of the comments said things like, ye uske saath jo hua, wo bohat bura hua, par waha akele jane ki zarurat hi kya thi? Right? What happened to her was sad and tragic, but why was she there alone in the first place? Now, not only did they get their facts wrong, because she wasn't alone in the first place, this question, this question that was asked of the woman when there were at least seven men present in the exact same open public space was never asked of the men. Because we think that if you are part of a certain gender, you need institutional sanctioning to even be present in a public space at a certain time. Another rape case that didn't receive as much publicity, a transgender, trans woman sex worker was raped in Ajmer by police. Um, and the police asked her, um, agar, the police told her, agar tujhe yahan khada rehna hoga, to pehle hamare saath karna hoga. If you want to stand here, you will have to perform act sexual activities with us first. Why? Because as a trans woman, you do not have right to occupy public space in the way that men do. So if we think that rape is caused by a violation of gender-based boundaries, all we end up doing is enforcing these exact boundaries. Right? If we think that rape is caused by a violation of cultural boundaries, if we think that rape happens because of increasing Western influence, increasing cultural degradation, which leads to moral degradation, which leads to rape, um, we enforce stronger religious and cultural policing. So a politician recently said, rape happens in India, not in Bharat. Um, and Bharat is the Hindi, Hindi term for India, but Bharat is also what we call India when we refer to India in terms of its ancestral heritage, in terms of its tradition. When we call India Bharat, we are placing India within a specific cultural, religious, moral, and ethical framework. So how do we respond to that if we think rape is because of Western influence? We do things like this. So in Gujarat, the police... Okay, this is by Mahila Sashaktikaran, which means the women's empowerment. Um, and in Gujarat, the police basically distributed these posters which say, Ayogya kapda peri ne bahar na nikro. Right? Don't wear inappropriate clothing and leave your house. Um, and the image is of four white women dressed in jeans and tops. Now, it is important that these are white women wearing Western clothing. Why? Because this is deemed inappropriate. Inappropriate, why? Are they showing any more skin than you would do if you were wearing a sari or a salwar kameez? No. In fact, if you're wearing a sari, you show your navel. You are showing more skin than if you were wearing jeans and a top, right? But this is still inappropriate. Inappropriate how? Culturally. Not because you're showing more skin that makes you sexually attractive, but because this is deemed culturally inappropriate. So again, yeah, we enforce cultural policing. Now, each of the people that came up with these solutions are people that, like you and me, agree that rape is wrong, right? These are people that ostensibly, if I were to talk to them, would have said the exact same thing that that person in the audience told me. They would have told me, hey, we're on your side. We get it. We get that rape is wrong. We are part of the solution, not part of the problem. You shouldn't be talking to us. You should be talking to the rapists because they are the problem. You don't have to be a rapist to be a part of the problem of rape. Thinking that rape is wrong for the wrong reasons still makes you part of the problem of rape. Rape is not about sex. This is another really important premise because a lot of people tend to think, well, hey, if we legalize sex work, that will take care of male sexual frustration. Rape will not happen. Well, guess what? India is in a country in which sex work is legal, and we still have a terrible rape problem because rape is not about sex. Rape is the symptom of a much larger social disease, a social disease that is the product of power imbalances, imbalances of gender and class and caste and political and religious identity. And if your solutions to the problem of rape, if your responses to the problem of rape are nested in those exact power structures, if you are trying to solve the problem of rape by strengthening the exact same power structures that rape is a manifestation of, then you are part of the problem. You are furthering the problem. So it matters 
It matters why you think rape is wrong. It matters if you think rape is wrong because of izzat, because of honor. Because what honor essentially is, is the institutional sanctioning of sexual activity. The reason that we think rape is wrong because of honor is the reason marital rape is still not illegal in India. Because if you're a legal authority and you think about marital rape, you go, well, the law said yes to this act of um, sex. Religion has said yes. Culture has said yes. The institutions of family have said yes. No violation of honor cannot be rape. If you think rape is a problem of honor, then you think the de debate around the rape of sex workers is a legitimate debate. Why? Because you think, well, they're already engaging in sexual activity that we deem as inappropriate for women. So they don't really have that much honor in the first place, so that can't actually be rape. If you think rape is a problem of honor, then you come up with, you know, things, the procedures like the two-finger test. The two-finger test, for th those of you that don't know, is when you insert two fingers up a rape victim's vagina to test if her hymen was freshly torn or not. Because we think that hymen links to virginity, links to honor. And if her hymen was already torn before the act of rape, if she was sexually active, then it can't really have been rape, right? Because she's already violating the cultural boundaries of what we consider to be okay female sexual activity. If you think rape is wrong because of a problem of honor, then you also think it is okay to use rape as punishment. So let's look at cup panchayats. Cup panchayats are self-appointed um, rural authorities that maintain law and order in villages. Um, and in a very ironic case that I recently read, a cup panchayat ordered the gang rape of a girl to punish her brother for attempting to molest another girl. Now they think, like you and me, that rape is wrong. That is why they're punishing the molestation of another girl. But they also think that rape is wrong because of a problem of honor. They think that if they order the gang rape of a girl, that that actually affects her brother, her family, her community. That is why they use rape as a punishment, because it is possible to get through to an entire network by, getting, by raping one woman. Right? This is why rape is used as a political tool, as a weapon of war. Not because the soldiers think rape is okay. They're doing it because they agree, like you and me, that rape is wrong. That by raping the women of another community, they're damaging that, that community because rape is linked to vile, to honor, to izzat. Um, if you think that rape is a problem um, because of you know, the violation of gender-based boundaries, then, um, and if you're a political authority, what you end up doing is you end up implementing gender-based curfews. So in Gurgaon last year, um, they implemented a curfew where women weren't allowed to work after 8 p.m. And that if you want a woman employee, you have to get special permission from the labor organization. Now, all that actually does is it strengthens the exact same problematic social economic frameworks that lead women to the subservient role that they are in society today anyway. Because if you're a woman, you first of all obviously can't do jobs such as journalism that require you to be out after a certain hour. You are less likely to be promoted because certain companies require that you work a certain number of hours over time in order to receive promotion. So again, your place in society that makes you the weaker sex is strengthened. And this place in society, this power imbalance is what leads you to be the rape victim is why we have a, such a huge rape problem in the first place. So again, the person that came up with that curfew was a person that, like you and me, thinks rape is wrong, but not for the right reasons. If you think rape is wrong because of, you know, um, again, gender-based boundaries. You tell your daughters not to be raped instead of your sons not to rape because you think that it is because of a violation of female boundaries that your daughters are being raped. Um, so rape is not the violation of honor or izzat or respect or dignity. Rape is the violation of an individual's right to bodily integrity and autonomy. And if we think of rape in this way, then all of the previous solutions obviously become 
ridiculous and ineffective. If you think about this, then you're not going to tell people to not wear short skirts because that is also a violation of autonomy. If you think about this, then marital rape is obviously not okay because marital rape, despite the sanctioning of the law and religion and family, is still the violation of the individual's right to bodily autonomy. The individual has said no and that is all that matters. If you think about rape in this way, then cup and chayats cannot use rape as a tool of punishment, soldiers cannot use rape as the weapon of war because all that is hurting is the individual in question, not their families, not their communities. If you think about rape in this way, then you don't install CCTV cameras in Coburn Park in Bangalore and prevent consensual couples from displaying affection because consent is the opposite of the violation of an individual's bodily integrity and autonomy. So again, it is important to understand why rape is wrong because just thinking rape is wrong and stopping the conversation there might actually make you part of the problem.